Hey everybody, it's Mr. White coming to you live from my office. Uh, thanks for tuning in to this video lecture all about the revolutions that happened in Latin America during the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the reason why we're studying about these revolutions is because these revolutions, just like the revolutions in the 13 colonies in, in France, were heavily influenced by the ideals of the Enlightenment. Things like the idea of freedom of speech, the inalienable rights of everybody, and the idea that the law applies to everyone, even the monarchs. Now this was in stark contrast to the absolute monarchies that had developed over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. Now, as these absolute monarchies began to crumble, the Enlightenment ideals dominated the new political systems that would eventually develop all over Latin America. The first major revolution of this age happened in the English 13 colonies. A decade later, the people of France rose up against the Bourbon dynasty under the slogan, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. The French and American revolutions were heavily influenced by the ideals of the Enlightenment. After the French Revolution, halfway around the world, the unbelievable success that happened in France would eventually inspire uprisings in the most unlikely of colonies. The very first revolution in Latin America happened in the small Caribbean island of Hispaniola. Now, you all probably know Hispaniola as the islands of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. But back in those days, it was called French and Spanish Santo Domingo. During the 18th century, the island of Hispaniola was divided into two European colonies. The French occupied the westernmost third of the island, and the Spanish occupied the two thirds in the east. These colonies were primarily used to grow sugarcane and other agricultural products for export back to France and Spain. At the time, over half a million African slaves were brought to the French half of Hispaniola as a part of the Atlantic Triangular Trade. The Triangular Trade depleted the populations of West Africa. Millions of people were forced to serve in bondage and lived in absolute misery. But soon, the ideas of the Enlightenment would set these people free. The French used brutal tactics like murder and torture, intimidation and rape to keep the slaves firmly under control. Now, it made sense that they did that because they were horribly outnumbered, something like 10 to 1. And it was eventually that unbalanced population of slaves to masters that would give them the opportunity to seek their freedom. Eventually, an African priest named Bukman called upon hundreds of thousands of African slaves to rise up and rebel against their cruel French masters. Within a few days, over 100,000 slaves answered Bookman's call. They were led by a brave and charismatic young man named Toussaint L'Ouverture. Toussaint's soldiers fought fiercely against their masters and eventually freed the slaves on the French part of the island. Encouraged by his success against the French, Toussaint led his army across the island to free the slaves of Spanish Santo Domingo. The success of their campaign liberated millions of people who had been living under tyranny. Toussaint was a man who was very strongly influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment. He often read books by men like Voltaire and Rousseau, and so he was intent on setting up a Republican-style democracy in Haiti. Now, the French were not willing to give up their colony so easily. In 1802, they sent 16,000 soldiers to reclaim Haiti for France. Toussaint fought bravely against these soldiers, but eventually he realized that he needed to sue for peace. Toussaint agreed to stop fighting the French if, and only if, they would abolish slavery in their colony. At first the French agreed, but then they double-crossed Toussaint. They arrested him and they threw him into a prison halfway around the world, back in France. This prison was high up in the Alps Mountains and Toussaint eventually died from a disease there in the year 1803. One of Toussaint's trusted generals, Jean-Jacques de Salines, took over as the leader of the revolution. 
following Toussaint's death. He declared the colony's independence from France on January the 1st, 1804, and named the new country Haiti, which means mountainous, in the language of the native Arawak peoples, the original inhabitants of the island. The Arawak were wiped out by European diseases, such as smallpox. The Spanish colonies of the New World were very sharply divided by class and race. Much like the social system that existed in India, the caste system, in Latin America, people were born into their social class. And no matter how hard you worked or what kind of things you did with your life, you were defined more by what you were rather than who you were. At the top of society were the white Europeans known as Peninsulares. The Peninsulares were people born in Spain or Portugal. This is the Iberian Peninsula of Europe. That's where they get the name Peninsulares. The Peninsulares were the only people in Latin American colonies who were allowed to hold high office in the government. Below them on the social ladder were the Creoles, Spanish or Portuguese people who were born to white parents in the New World. They were allowed to serve in the military, but not in the government. Despite the fact that they were of the same race, the social class of these two groups was sharply divided. The Creoles and the Peninsulares controlled all the power and wealth in Latin America. They didn't share very much with the people who were below them. Below the Peninsulares and Creoles were the Mestizos, people who were of half European and half Native American descent. Another group of mixed race were the mulattoes, people of half European and half African ancestry. The African slaves and Native Americans found themselves at the very bottom of society, with the Native Americans actually being treated worse than the African slaves. The difference was the African slaves had economic value to the Europeans, whereas the Native Americans did not. Despite the fact that they enjoyed a very good lifestyle in the colonial system, it was the Creoles who would eventually lead the cause of independence in Latin America. The reason why was because even though these Creoles were allowed to have a high social class, they were never allowed to have the power of government. Remember, that was reserved only for the Peninsulares. As these Creoles were educated over in Europe, many of them adopted the ideas of the Enlightenment. Those ideas were infectious and they began to spread all across the Latin American colonies as more and more Creoles studied abroad in Europe. In the year 1808, Napoleon invaded Spain. He defeated and overthrew King Ferdinand VII. In his place, Napoleon installed his own brother Joseph as the King of Spain. The Creoles in the Spanish colonies of the New World did not feel any loyalty to the king imposed on them by Napoleon. They argued that when Ferdinand was removed, the power of Spain shifted to the people. Rebellions broke out all across Central and South America as the people attempted to set up their own independent governments. Napoleon was eventually defeated and King Ferdinand returned to Spain in 1814. But by then, it was too late. The revolution could not be stopped. The two most influential leaders of the revolutions in South America were Simon Bolivar and Jose de San Martin. These two Creole military leaders would eventually lead the battle for the Latin American people against the Spanish crown. Simon Bolivar was born to a wealthy Creole family from Venezuela. As a young man, he studied and lived abroad in Spain. He attended a prestigious military school and during this time he studied and was strongly influenced by the writers of the Enlightenment. While studying in Europe, he even had the chance to attend Napoleon's coronation in Paris. In 1813, Bolivar returned to his homeland and took the lead in the struggle for Venezuelan independence. Despite some early successes, he was forced to flee to Jamaica and then later to Haiti in 1815. The Haitians offered to help Venezuela in the fight against the Spanish if, and only if, they promised to abolish slavery in South America. <laughs>
Meanwhile, as Bolivar was battling the Spanish in the north, the colony of Argentina, here in the south, declared its independence from Spain. After decisive battles with the Spanish in Colombia, Bolivar liberated Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador from Spanish rule in the year 1819. He combined them together into a supranational state called Gran Colombia, of which he was the first president. Bolivar then vowed to free all of the South American people from Spanish colonial rule. After declaring their independence from Spain, Argentina knew the only way they could maintain their independence was to dislodge the Spanish from their other strongholds in South America. In 1817, troops led by the general Jose San Martin, a brave Creole who also studied in Europe, marched across the Andes Mountains to liberate Chile from Spain. Jose San Martin was fantastically successful, and later, with the help of Simón Bolívar, he marched on the last remaining Spanish colony, Peru, in 1824. Under Bolívar's command, the Spanish were defeated in Peru. Now, the Spanish had no more colonies in South America. In contrast to the top-down revolutions that happened in South America, the revolutions in Central America, Mexico primarily, were led from the bottom up by mestizo peasants. In 1810, a poor Catholic priest named Miguel Hidalgo called on the people of Mexico to overthrow their colonial masters. Despite his poor upbringings, Hidalgo was well-educated and heavily influenced by the writers of the Enlightenment. Hidalgo was able to rally an army of approximately 60,000 peasants who marched on Mexico City in 1811. After Hidalgo's defeat, another mestizo leader named Jose Maria Moreos took the role of revolutionary leader in Mexico. He continued to fight bravely for four years. However, he was eventually defeated by a brilliant Creole military officer named Augustin de Irtubide. A second chance at independence came after another revolution in Spain brought a new regime to power. The colonial rulers of Mexico feared that the new government would bring unwelcome changes, so they decided to take up the cause of Mexican independence. Ironically, Irtubide, the man who defeated Morelos, took up the role of leader of the revolution against Spain. Irtubide was successful, and in 1821, he declared Mexico's independence from Spain. Irtubide actually created himself as the first emperor of Mexico. That was what he called himself. Uh, he actually changed his name to Emperor Augustine I of Mexico. Um, he also tried to rule over all of Central America, countries like El Salvador and Honduras and Nicaragua. Of course, they weren't too crazy about that idea, and eventually, Irtubide was deposed in a coup. A coup is when you overthrow the government. Now, uh, after Irtubide was overthrown in 1823, all the rest of the Central American countries began to declare their independence from Spain. And that was really the beginning of the end of the Spanish Empire in the Western Hemisphere. The last little thing that they held on to was the island of Cuba. And as you'll find out later on in world history, they weren't going to have that for very much longer either. Okay, so now you need to study these notes, you need to pay very close attention, maybe watch the video again if you missed some of what I said. Because when you come to class, you're going to be expected to use this information to do, uh, let's say, a creative project. See you guys next time.